since everyone here, guys and gals, are all writing fiction, I'm going to not talk about nonfiction, if that's all right. So I, that way, it's going to be applicable to everyone here. I've got tons of info online about nonfiction stuff, so if you want that, just let me know, and I can do tons of training on that. Um, so for fiction, um, the way I look at an author platform, basically the definition, is for me, is the methods, tools, strategies, resources you use to connect with your readers in such a way that they will actually buy your book, right? So when you're talking to like a traditional agent or trying to get a traditional book deal, <coughs> they want you to have an author platform, right? And you have to have numbers. So you have to say, you know, I've got 10,000 Facebook fans. You know, I speak to, you know, 60,000 people a year at conferences, right? You have to have hard numbers for what your author platform is. Um, as a self-published author, you don't really care. I mean, yeah, it's great to have 10,000 Facebook fans, but what you really, all you care about is sales. And as a self-published author, you are the publisher, so you can actually see your sales, which is very different from, you know, the traditional right? You can't really see your sales except they're six months or something. So, um, so it's, it's a little bit different. But um, also for fiction and nonfiction, I find it's very different author platform. Um, because a lot of, you know, we talk about nonfiction, you know, what are you talking about? You're talking about experts generally, right? So if someone's an expert <coughs> on health, you know, they might have uh, clients that they see for consulting and coaching. They might speak at conferences and so forth. Um, but, you know, if you write uh, urban fantasy, like, what's your platform, right? So um, you're probably not going to be speaking at conferences about, you know, urban fantasy, um, except, you know, there might be one conference or a few conferences, right? So how do you actually go out there and build a platform? What I've seen that works best in the self-publishing arena by far is just writing really great books, like, like you mentioned that. Um, because, and writing lots of books, right? Because now we have all these, um, basically, readers who, who read, you know, and, and, I, and I specialize in ebooks as well. Um, so just, I'll give you like a broader view of the market right now. So uh, the trade market for books, um, which is, you know, not fiction, fiction books, not textbooks, but the trade market globally is about $80 billion a year right now, right? And, and in the next five years, <coughs> there's gonna be a change about $10 billion. So about $10 billion decrease in physical book sales and $10 billion increase in ebook sales. So the industry's not growing, it's actually shrinking after inflation, um, but there's this huge shift from uh, physical sales to ebook sales. And I'm not saying that you know, physical sales are gonna disappear, but they're not, but ebook sales are really where all the growth is in the industry right now. Also digital audiobooks are growing really really fast as well. Um, so digital audiobooks is another, another area um, you definitely wanna check out. Um, if you're not doing that already, ACX.com is really powerful. Um, ACX.com is the website. It's owned by Amazon, and they're basically kind of like a broker, marketplace, and publisher for uh, or distributor for audiobooks, right? So they distribute everywhere. Uh, Audible right now is owned by Amazon, uh, and that's like 90 plus percent of the digital audiobook market. They also distribute to iTunes and everything. But on ACX.com, you can actually find um, narrators, professional voice actors, professional narrators who will narrate your book for you. And you can either pay them a flat fee and keep 100% of the royalties uh, after you pay the distributor, or you can just uh, say, hey, I want to split the royalties 50-50 with you. So you have no upfront fee at all. So you can get your audiobooks professionally produced without paying a dime, and then you split 50-50 all the revenue um, with the narrator. So that's a really powerful uh, um, methodology as well. So if you don't have a big budget, I'd definitely go that route. I'd split 50-50 royalties and get your audiobooks up, because that can be big. Um, but in terms of author platform, uh, writing great books, write as many books as possible. I think that's key. And then there's really seven ways that you can build the author platform. Um, so one is like radio, TV, uh, social media. So that's you know Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest. Uh, also, I consider forums as well as social media. So uh, forums, I think, are one of the most powerful ways for, for novelists to, to build a really big platform. If you look at Fifty Shades of Grey, her entire platform was built on forums. She was writing fan fiction for Twilight and Vampire and things like that. And she built this huge following up through her fan fiction uh, forum that she was writing in. And then she actually published Fifty Shades of Grey like two years before she, she it was published under a different name two years previously. It didn't do very well. She went back to writing fan fiction, unpublished that book, rebranded it, published Fifty Shades of Grey. <coughs> she had the big platform and that's when it took off. So forums are really, really powerful. Um, so just to finish up, the final uh, places for to build your um, platform, uh, after social media, TV, radio, uh, there's video. Online video is really powerful. Um, uh, and then podcasting, podcasts are really powerful right now. Um, so online video, podcasts, radio, I have my notes over there, but um, TV, radio. Um, can you guys think of any other ways to build your platform that are really powerful right now? 
vlogging. Vlogging? Right, vlogging is another big one. Did you say vlogging or blogging? Vlogging. It's the same thing. Right. Yeah. How about like Kickstarter and funding campaigns? Yeah, so that can be great too. That That is, so I would really consider that more like social media, but definitely, yeah, that, that's a great way to do it for sure. I've seen a lot of people do really successful Kickstarter campaigns. Do you think the a Kickstarter is a good way to build your platform, or do you think that it's not going to work until you have a platform to run it on? Right? Because I, I mean, so a lot of people launch a Kickstarter starter that kind of flops right. because they think, oh, I'm going to put this big Kickstarter out there, everybody's going to love it, I'm going to get a ton of readers. But the truth is that most of the Kickstarters are funded by a core group of fans, right? Right. So, so here's my whole strategy and philosophy behind marketing, and it goes really way down on other platform. It's all about audience. So, who is your audience, right? And how do you connect with that audience? So. One of the reasons forums are so powerful is because you know there's, um, say, a million people on a forum of writing about sci-fi, caring about sci-fi, right? So if you go on that forum with, let's say, a million people who are passionate about what you're writing about, that's like you couldn't ask for a better audience, right? Because that's, everyone's right there, and there's a there's a <coughs> way of a platform of technology that you can you can communicate with people by posting in the forum and answering people's <coughs> questions and so forth. So for me, it's all about okay, who is my audience and where are they? How can I connect with them, right? Um, <coughs> and I think the, the, you know, most authors, we just don't, we aren't taught this, and so we don't think about it from this perspective, and so we think, oh, well, everyone wants to, right? Like, everyone wants to read my cozy mysteries because it's family friendly, so, you know, no one's gonna be put off by it, so everyone will read it. But in actuality, you know, it's a very specific market. And so do you know who the demographic is that reads uh, yes. your book? <coughs> yes. So can you describe them? Can you, like, describe the person that reads your book? Uh, um, basically, most of them are female. Most of them are between the ages of 55 and up. Mm -hmm. um, that's about 80% of my 80% yeah. of it. Um, <clears throat> they can be all over the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So. Where would she find them? Like, where would she right. find her audience? So, so that's what you want to do. So, you first of all, want to find out who is your I, audience. I read cozies all the time, so mm -hmm. I know exactly where those people are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So, where are they hanging out? How do you reach them? Um, there are just several places. Um, there are um, uh, basically reviewers. There are a bunch of reviewers that review nothing but cozies, this sort of thing. Um, on Goodreads, there's a deal for cozies. Um, uh, Amazon has a deal for cozies. Um, mine, mine are cozies, but they go beyond that too. So I can, I can, I can vary. My audience, I can pick up from various places, this sort of thing. Um, I'm. What I do is almost bordering on on YA. They've mm -hmm. they've told me that 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 simply because it's small town, it's western and it's horses, mm -hmm. and so that covers my. So head. I think like like a Goodreads would be like a channel, like a marketing channel. I think when when you say where would my audience be if it's oh. if it's women that are fifty five plus. They would be at, here's an example, knitting conventions. They yeah. would be Well, I, I, I agree with both. I mean, I think, I think it's powerful to, I think like, Goodreads and forums are really powerful because people who are there, already they already opted in. They already asked to, to hear about information like yeah. this, right? Yeah. Whereas at a knitting forum, those people haven't asked to be you know, told and to find out about books. So you know, at the knitting forum, maybe only 10% of the people are in her market. Yeah. But in a, in a group <laughs> online for cozy mystery readers, 100% of the people in that group are your potential readers, right? Yes. Yes. Um, and you don't have to have 100% of the people in your group be potential readers for it to be a good place to market yourself and to build your platform, but that really helps a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people think, I have to have a, a, pla a platform of millions of people. Um, but it's just not true. You know, the truth is, if you look at any business, you know, there's a small percentage of your customers, of your readers, who are most passionate about what you do, and will share the most, right? These people are like, we call them brand ambassadors, the people who spread word of mouth, people who tell their friends. So someone who reads your book and says, oh my gosh, I love it so much, and they go tell all their friends and they join a local writer's group and tell everyone in the writer's group about your book. Those, you know, that one relationship is far more valuable than, you know, 10,000 Facebook fans who don't really care. The fact that I write a series, that, that helps too, because they can go from one to the other. <clears throat> I'm just doing it backwards because I, Anyway, <laughs> yeah. doing three to one, but it, it's, it's, yeah, okay, we had a, I have a mystery group and we were discussing things, and my thing was, it's just as easy to advertise three books as it is to advertise one, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, yeah. 
And so five foot, you know, you know, I'm, I intend putting them all out at the same time, basically within a year of each other. Within, within a year, I plan on having four books out. Right. Yeah, see, I look at books and manuscripts as like real estate. It's like if you have an investment property and it's just sitting there empty, every single month you're losing money. Right, so every month your books are sitting in your shelf, they're sitting on your computer, the manuscripts aren't published, you're losing money. Um, so I know we're here to talk about platform, but um, does anybody have any questions so far? So you went through radio, TV, social media, video, podcasting, blogging. One more. It's on my phone. <laughs> oh, okay, we'll figure it out. Unfortunately, yeah. okay. We'll figure it out afterwards. Right. I'll put it in the notes. Oh, he's <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. I have more of a comment. Uh, I kind of want to go back to the Kickstarter thing for a minute. Uh, so I attended a uh, Kickstarter project jam where the people that work at Kickstarter and people that have uh, done successful projects through Kickstarter where they're all talking about this kind of thing. So what they said was that, uh, to your question, Matt, about um, is it a platform in itself? Not really. So the website itself, most people that back uh, Kickstarter projects are not from the website. It's always from something else. Right. So you could have sort of a Facebook um, uh, network of sorts, a Twitter network, that kind of thing. And like like what you said about having a key person. So on social media, that's also what I what I would use. Like there's people who have like, maybe you only have like 300 followers, fine. But you might know somebody who's like a million. And if you have a good relationship with them, tell them, oh, hey, you know, I'm doing this book and they're willing to mention the book on their platform, then it's the same as you having their platform. Exactly. So, um, but for Kickstarter, they just said specifically that just having a Facebook account, connecting your Kickstarter uh, account to your Facebook account gives you legitimacy that you're a real person and that increases the likelihood of your thing being funded by like 20% or something like that. So it gives you a huge amount. So it's like all these little steps, little tricks you gotta use to um, uh, get it to work. And um, so yeah, you totally have to have uh, the backers before you even launch the campaign, otherwise it's, right. it's, it's, not going to um, it's, yeah. it's kind of just like, it's floating out there in the void. Right, right, unless you happen to be lucky enough to get Kickstarter to notice it and, and they put it on their um, their favorite, page. yeah, exactly. Right. Which is extremely unlikely. Yeah. 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 yeah, so that, that was a really powerful strategy to share that I love to teach people. I call it connecting with influencers. So if you can find people in your industry who already have a platform built, maybe they've got a big email list, they've got a big following on Twitter or Facebook or a big blog, and they're already connected with your audience who you would love to, to share information about your book or, or what you're doing, that is really that can be a huge relationship and a, and a huge way to get tons of sales really, really fast. Right. Um, to, to guest blogs on their sites if they want you. Exactly, right, exactly. So that's one thing you can do. So I've, I've done guest blogging for years. Um, basically, you can just go into Google, you can type in, you know, cozy mystery blog, and you can find, you know, Google will just rank them by the, the most successful ones. And then you can get a plugin, I call it, it's called the Alexa plugin. Um, so if you don't know what Alexa is, it basically ranks websites based on how much traffic they get. Um, so if you look at that plugin, it ranks them kind of like Kindle sales rank or Amazon sales rank. So number one is the most traffic website in the world is Facebook. Number two has a little bit less traffic. Number three is a little less traffic and so on. So I'm always looking for sites with a, a, a US Alexa rank of 300,000 or less. If they have that traffic rank, that means they're getting like over 1,000 people a day on their website, which is really, really good. Um, so if you find a, a high traffic website uh, who's you know writing to your market, to your audience, I would definitely reach out to them and say, hi, you know my name is Tom, I'm an author, I write, you know, cozy romance novels or whatever. Um, you know, I'd love to you know share a post for your um, readers about you know whatever, um, and just connect with them. Be personal. Don't 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 do it like in a spammy way. Don't say hey I. Um, I mean, keep it personal. Does that make sense? I'm saying. Um, yeah. I did say the same point. Um, if people um, that write the same things you're writing, write blogs, be a part of their community, right? So comment on their post. You know what I mean? So like, yeah. they have like. It's like you know, every person, every person blog has like probably like hundred people that are always there commenting on stuff. So you get known like, oh, that's that guy who always comments uh, thoughtfully about so and so's posts. They know your name. You might say like, oh, hey, I might have like this too. Then they're willing to listen as opposed to you just coming out of nowhere and saying like, oh, I'm just person selling a book. They don't care. But if they know you already. They know your opinion. They know they kind of like you already. Then they're more willing to listen to you. Totally. Yeah, I rank this under the same heading as content marketing. Mm -hmm. If you're participating in a discussion and you're being helpful. And useful and insightful and thoughtful for something. Like, you know, very often these blogs will allow you to input not just you know, your name and email address, but your website. So when people click on your icon, they get taken to your site. Yeah. I really like what that guy had to say about it. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, so I look at everything I'm doing, like content marketing and online marketing. I don't, you know, like everyone hates spammers. Like, you know, you know who they are. They're the person in the group who's just like, oh, my new book is out, you know, buy it. So, you know, it's on sale. Everyone leave me a review. and Tell all your friends, and it's like you don't even know who the person post. is, and they're at like 25 exclamation points, and it's all capitals, and it's like, <laughs> you know, come on, like really, like I don't need that, right? Um, 
But you know, what if someone came into your into your you know the community for um, a forum online with people who are passionate about about the topic, and you wrote you know top five things I learned launching my first self published book, right? And, and you so wrote that article. To speak at an author. Meeting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's so many ways that you can add value and give back to people. And when you do that, people will just naturally, you know, they'll go to you. They'll say, "Oh my gosh, I love your article. That was, you know, so so helpful. Thank you so much." They'll check out your books. They look at what you're doing. They'll probably tell their friends. Um, and even if they don't buy from you, they they're still you left them with a good feeling, and they're gonna know you, um, and you're gonna attract people that way rather than you know scaring people away by being you know like a spam or just being totally self promotional. Traditionally, in terms of sales and stuff, the, the common wisdom used to be that people had to see something seven times before they'd buy it. Mm -hmm. Do you find that still holds true online? I think yes and no. I mean, the thing with Amazon, um, well, it depends where you're marketing, totally. Yeah. Um, the thing with Amazon is it's such a trusted retailer now that it doesn't need to be at all. So yeah. like, if someone goes to your, your book page on Amazon, they see you've got 25 reviews, you've got like four and a half star average. Um, if they're a reader of your genre, and they like what they see, and they like the reviews, uh, and they're looking for a new book, they're gonna buy it. They don't, it doesn't matter if they've never heard of you before. Uh, it, it depends on the reader, though. I mean, some readers are very picky. They only read readers they know. They only read you know, traditionally published stuff, but some, some readers are looking for new well, stuff. One of the things Amazon did here a year or so ago is they went through and <clears throat> took out all your friends. <laughs> the reviews are uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so yeah. That, that made what they do much more legitimate. Right. How do they know people are your friends person? Well, oh, big data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's and it's the same thing too. They give them five. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. But when you read the just when you read what they've said, you know they never read the book. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And generally you know, speaking, the ones that add love, mom. I think, yeah. I think one of the thing, one of the interesting things is um, okay. Philip Kerr did a thing for for Mark Pryor. It said, Mark Pryor is one of the smartest new, new writers on the block, okay? He never read one of his books. That was just, he walked up to the guy and said, um, okay, I, <laughs> I was in a Mark Pryor deal the other day. Anyway, he walked up to a, a convention and he said, would you write me a review? And he said, sure. And he said, where can I send my book? And he said, oh, I don't want your book. Here, there's my review. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, and it's so funny because it happens all the time. And if people, you know, if you look at the forums, a lot of like uh, traditionally published people or you know whatever, they'll say, you know, well, self-published authors, you only all your reviews are from your friends, and it's so illegitimate because you're asking your friends for support. But you look at the traditional publishing industry; people are doing that for hundreds of years. Yeah. You know, it's always all the reviews in the back cover are there before the book was ever even published in the first place. And a lot of times, those people never even read the book. So well, especially when you get um, into some of these like you know smaller nichier genres like all those people know each other right they all yeah. are in the same kind of circle yeah but that's also a powerful marketing strategy i mean if like i don't know how big your genre is but if you know a lot of self-published authors in your genre or where they hang out if you all work together instead of seeing each other as competitors see each other <laughs> as collaborators and you can work on books together a lot of authors are doing box sets now yeah. so they might contribute like you know and a lot of novelists we've got short stories right and it's like, well, what are you gonna do with a you know twenty page story? It's like nothing you can do with it. But what if you know ten um, sci fi authors took a short story, bundled them together, you've got a three hundred page book of short stories, you all publish them together, you all promote them together to your audience, and you'll get a lot of sales that way. And even if it's just ninety nine cents or even if it's free, it will be attracting lots of new readers. Uh, yeah, it, then they it's go out and buy all, It's introducing a bunch of people that wouldn't ordinarily be introduced. So that exactly. that's very yeah. Actually yeah. I see blurs on the back cover as, as more of a um, Kind of a, a trust verification thing, right? You know, I'm looking at the back cover of this book. I'm not on Amazon. You know, I'm I'm, I'm, right. I'm someplace else, and I'm writing in, in the fantasy genre. And you know, J.K. Rowling says there's a strong new voice in in you know in fiction. You know, okay, well now that's like getting Oprah's seal of approval right. on your book. I mean, like, you know, no seriously. I mean, that's why Oprah's books sell because she's a trusted source. She yeah. says it's good. Well, she also has a platform to reach people through her you right. know, TV show and online and magazine. Right. But J.K. Rowling isn't going to spontaneously talk about that book when she's doing a press conference for her stuff. Right. You know, it's right. only her name on the back of the book that's, that's giving you any mileage. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, here's a great example. Amanda Palmer just released a new book called *The Art of Asking*, and on the back cover was a quote from Seth Godin. I don't know if he actually read the book, but his quote was there, so I'm sure somebody saw that and went, "Huh." Yeah. I have a question about the author platform on um, rebranding. You said the woman that wrote Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah. Did she change her name also? Like, I don't know if she changed her name. I know that she changed the title of the book and the cover. 
I don't know if she changed her name at that point. Because, like, isn't it true that if your books are kind of floundering, you don't have a lot of sales, and then you, like, like people would ignore your, your, your name, would, your author rank would drop? Like, like poison. Right, like, no, like it you're doesn't poison matter. and you have to rename yourself after no, that? No, That's matter. traditional publishing thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, actually, in traditional publishing, they track, you know, all your numbers are tracked your ISBN. And that's one of the reasons I say if you're going to self-publish and you are maybe want to traditionally publish later, don't get an ISBN on your ebooks yeah. unless you really uh, are knowing to sell at least 5,000 books. Because if they see you've got an ISBN on your ebook and they see you only sold 500 copies, um, you know, they're going to be like, hey, you're a nobody, we're not going to publish you. Um, so you can do a pen name. Um, but e either way, you don't need an ISBN for ebooks, which I think is a big mistake a lot of people make. They'll go out and buy ISBNs, and the only reason to have one would be because um, you wanted to track those numbers so that you could go to an agent and say, "Hey, look, we sold ten thousand ebooks in six months. You know, let's get a traditional publishing deal done." So an ISBN allows you to track. Your yeah, the ISBN ideas. allows the traditional publishing industry to track. That's the whole point. But, but not you. Well, just the traditional publishing. Well, you can, you can go. You can buy the data, but it, the issue is it's very expensive. Most most self-published authors wouldn't buy you that know, data. It's it's good in several areas if you if you have an ISBN number. Uh, uh, in the fact that that if someone wants to order a hundred copies, <laughs> they can do it easily. Um, this sort of thing for for any for any other reason, I mean, there's an expense to it, and. You you already I mean okay a lot of people will tell you have not you have you need an ISBN number because of copyright and that's wrong. Yeah, that's not true. Okay. So I've got a question about the whole platform creation. Is it, I, I'm feeling like this chicken and the egg sort of thing. Like, do you create your different sort of social media channels, your blog, whatever first, and then jump into these things? Are you jumping? I mean, you're like and like publish. Do you do it before or after you publish your blog? Like trying to figure out like how right. to line things up. I mean, you can have all your social media channels, but if you're not actively doing anything yet, then they're you know what I mean. Like right. like how do you put it all together? So I think um, for me, it's just get it done as fast as you can and with however you can. Like don't don't worry about making a mess. You can clean it up later. Just okay. go out and make a mess. So if you don't have Facebook yet, go out and create Facebook. If you don't have Twitter yet, go out and create it. And you're not committing to every day. I'm gonna spend an hour on Facebook when you create a profile. You don't have to do that. But just just go out there and be there and you know do it right. Because otherwise it's going to be on your to do list. So oh, I still have to go out and create a Facebook. It takes five minutes to set up a Facebook profile, five minutes to set up a Twitter account, five minutes to set up a Pinterest account. You don't have to commit to posting lots of content, right? But just having it there will allow you to go when you do launch a book or you launch something else. You'll have that profile. There. And also people will find you. So your friends on Facebook, like how all the social media networks now do it is they all connect you through Facebook or through your email. So when someone new signs up for Pinterest. You know, they'll say, hey, Pinterest will say, hey, you know, connect via Facebook to see who your friends are. If you already have an account, they'll already add you and you'll already have followers, right? So you'll have your followers on all these social media platforms as soon as you make your accounts. Um, but it turns out actually, you know, where you spend your time and how you do that. Um, the number one focus, if you haven't published a book yet, I and mean, if you're going to self-publish, go ahead and self-publish as fast as you can. Um, then I would worry about, you know, getting your second book out. And only after you have your second book out, I wouldn't even worry about marketing on that really. Um, because otherwise what's going to happen is you're going to try to spend all your time marketing one book and you're not going to have anything to follow up to, to, with that sale. And so you know, it's much more effective if you have multiple books out because once someone loves your first book, they're going to buy the rest of your books. Well, what if you've already written like a six book series? Huh? They'd publish them. All of them at once? Or like, you well, you probably wouldn't publish all of them at once unless they're all already fully edited and everything just because the time it's going to take. Mm -hmm. So I would just do book one at a time, but as soon as you can. And I was thinking is, um, to her point, her question, um, you're writing a, a fantasy book, right? Well, that's, yeah. But, but that's not all you do in your life. Right, you, right. Which is many more dimensions to you as a person. Of right? course. So you can talk about those things on your social platforms, right? And people get to know you, just get to know you as a person. And they say, oh, by the way, I'm writing this book. Right. Really? Oh, we're very interested in what you to say, period. Let me see what this book is about. So definitely, yeah. definitely do this social networking first. Well, and I kind of ask the question because I have a blog right now that isn't huge, but I have a, a decent number of followers on it. But it's just sort of like the hodgepodge of everything I feel like posting with some stuff on writing. Yeah. And I was thinking of like turning it around to be more of a writing focused blog now. <clears throat> What's the name of it? Oh, it's, it's just it's just my personal blog. Okay, so that's that's good. So that's actually the best way to do it for an author is, is have your blogs, your websites, your social media be your name. Um, if you if they, if that's the name you're going to use for your pen name, so whatever your pen name is or whatever your author name is, I would focus on that, and I would try to focus on one market. The big mistake people make is you know you're writing a, 
cozy mystery today, and tomorrow it's a romance, and then the next day you're writing a book on gardening, and then you know you're writing a book on you know how to be an amazing you know wife or husband, and it's just like you're all over the place, right? And it's very hard. Well, it, it's bad if your goal is to make money, right? If your goal is to make money as fast as possible, that's not a good strategy because you're going to um, number one, it's gonna, you're going to either have to create multiple platforms, like like four Twitter accounts for every market you're in, and it's going to waste so much time trying to manage all that. Um, so that's so, true for fiction authors, right? Use your name as your platform. Is it also true for non-fiction authors? Yeah, totally. Interesting. What yeah. about like, unless unless you have a brand? So if you're a non-fiction person and you have a brand, and you're like Total Health Solutions, and you provide like coaching services mm -hmm. for health, and you want to brand that instead of your personal name, that's fine too. Um, but in my like, I know this from personal experience because I had all these different brands and all these different markets, and I had all these different Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts, and it was just like such a headache trying to manage it all. Mm -hmm. So eventually, I just you know piled it down. So now I've got three Facebook pages um, instead of like the seven I had. And, and I only have one just, Twitter account. Just to be clear, we're talking about a Facebook page for an author that is an author's page in Facebook, not their personal one. Right. right. That's exactly. separate from Absolutely. that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. One of the one of the minor things you can do when you're when you're doing with the blog or when you're dealing with Facebook too is if you see something written that you agree with, put a like because chances are that person is going to go in and see who liked it, <laughs> and that's another way. Uh, it's it's a simple trick <coughs> you can get your name out there, you know, at least to some other people. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds peculiar and this sort of thing, but it works, and it's 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 one keystroke. I don't think it's peculiar. I mean, a lot of people set up social media accounts, and this is true in business as it is in, in writing, um, any business really. You know, people set up a social media account and they think, oh, well, now everybody's going to come uh, because I set it up. But it's not true. You actually have to interact and yeah. use it. Otherwise, it's not going to do the work it's supposed yeah. to do. I mean, I, I work with companies doing marketing for them for my day job, and I see this all the time. Uh, they're like, oh, I have this brand new startup. I made a Twitter page. Like, do you use it? No. Well, why did you make it? I don't. I don't understand what the point is. Why well, have it if you're not going to use it? So, yeah. I, mean, I think that's as true um, with a Facebook page, a Twitter account, a blog, whatever. Whatever you decide you want to do, just actually do it. Otherwise, yeah. And you have to go. Time. You have to go into other people's Facebook pages and this sort of thing and look at them. Especially if you're on the same. Especially if you're all writing mysteries or something like mm -hmm. this. You you want to you want to encourage other people because you want them to come and encourage you. So it's a, you know, and you don't, you don't have to do a whole lot. I mean, you don't have to sit there and for, for 30 minutes and write a big... Right. 15 minutes a day it. is like my magic number for everything. So 15 minutes a day, I'm going to write. 15 minutes a day, I'm going to write a blog post. 15 minutes a day, I'm going to write a book. 15 minutes a day, I'm going to do social media. And just by setting it at such a low number, it doesn't feel like a huge commitment. So every day, I'm going to actually get it done. And if I want to, if I get so in the flow and I write for three hours, there's nothing wrong with that. But I don't feel like I'm forced to write for five hours a day. Right? I don't feel like I'm forced to spend five hours a day on Facebook. Because it's sort of like you're checking in every day and seeing, can I do this today? Exactly. And you're just getting your focus on the work. So when I actually go on Facebook for 15 minutes, I'm writing content for my page. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm checking messages and stuff. I'll do that after. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to post content that's going to help people. The first thing I do when I go to a forum, I'm going to post something valuable to help people in that group. Because otherwise, you get so lost in the messages and the writing the comments and stuff like that, which is important. Right. But if you're not actually adding value and creating new things, then you're not really building your platform. All you're doing is just maintaining what you have already. And I noticed that what a lot of people do is you get stuck. You try to, you know, you're just spending, you spend an hour a day on Facebook just answering comments and things, which is good, but you're not creating anything new. All you're doing is maintaining what you're already doing. This is a really interesting topic. I'd love for you to go in more into detail. So focus on adding value and creating new things. So let's use uh, Facebook as an example. What's the difference between adding value on Facebook and just being there? So yeah. So just an example. so well, there's a couple ways you can do it too, and you can you can do like a multi-platform strategy. So let's say you have a blog and you've got all these social media things. So like you you write a new blog post. Mm -hmm. Then what I would do is I, was, I would write the new blog post, I'd publish that new post on my blog, then I would go to Facebook and say, hey, I've got a new blog post, here's the number one thing you're going to learn in this blog post, share that on Facebook, then have the link to it. And you can do the same thing on Google Plus and Pinterest and everywhere else. Okay. And that way, then what you've done is you've created that one piece of really valuable content on your blog, and then you're sharing that in a way that's valuable and not, right. not spammy on social media. Okay, what, what's all this about Pinterest? Isn't Pinterest just like for posting up photos? Right. But um, so Pinterest is really good though. Um, if your if your audience is female, Pinterest is, is amazing because like most of your users are female, and it really is, yeah. So it's images but also videos, 
Um, but every blog post, you can insert an image in your blog post, right? So if you were gonna, you know, if you were launching a new book, like a romance novel, and your audience is women, you know, I would, I would have the cover of my book on the blog post, and then I would pin that image onto Pinterest and say, hey, you know, my new book is out here. It is that kind of thing. The, the way media, people read yeah. on Pinterest and yeah. things like that. There's also a lot of people go like idea gathering. So there's some people who will have board books I love, mm -hmm. and that would be something like <clears throat> posted on that, and other people. Looking for more books, you might go for that. That's a good idea. If you have images, like I have a friend who, when she writes, she takes a bucket of images and she puts them on her <laughs> idea board to help her focus. Yeah. So if you have those type of images, you could post those and people would look. Like, oh, I've also, also seen do... people use, sorry, Rashawn, I've seen people use Pinterest to um, like put together brainstorming images. Like, say you're planning a new story, you go on in Pinterest and you put together a collection of images that jog your imagination about that story and then you can share that with your audience. It's not something that you necessarily created, right? Like you might have found every image on Pinterest, but because you used it, created a collection, you can then share it as if it's like a new, like it is a new piece of content because you curated it, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, what were you gonna say? Exactly what you just said. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, with, uh, with my universe, Alizar, what I do is um, a certain style um, for like Casa Tillerman is very Art Nouveau. So a un something that I think that looks good for a uniform, I put it up there and I explain how this fits into my story and some architecture. Or right now I'm looking for references for the Iron Bay and it needs to be Art Deco. So I'm pulling three or four or five different versions of that that I think the artist would use, put them up on Pinterest, explain this is what, these are ideas. What do you Cross guys think? Referencing of influences kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And then people say, well, I like this one, or I like that one, or what about something with like people on the next side of it, or something Russian, or, and that gets um, conversation going on. Mm -hmm. And they're interested in seeing what you chose. Mm -hmm. So one thing that, um, it, to, to speak more about this adding value thing, one mistake I see a lot of authors making on Twitter is that they'll sign up for a Twitter account, and all they'll use it for is buy my book. Buy my book. Right. Buy my book. And it's the same, you know, like a variation of the same message over and over again. Right. Um, so explain to us why that's not adding value. Well, it's not adding value because if someone, like, so the way people use social media when they're checking out someone new is they're going to go to your wall, right? And what your wall is basically the list of everything you posted. Mm -hmm. And they're going to look at what you posted. So if the last 10 posts are just buy my book, then they're going to be like, well, this person is, you know, Shouting they're the same thing over and over again. Like, obviously, I'm not going to follow them. Right. But if they see one post that says buy my book and they see nine other posts that are you answering people, talking about, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. um, you know, just something different that's positive, then they're much more likely to follow you. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. important to note that when you say adding value, it means valuable to other people. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Oh, there it is. That's a good point. Yeah, and that's <laughs> no, so funny. That. I mean, it's amazing. It's so, yeah, it's so true. Because a lot of, like, we, you know, as authors, as creators, as entrepreneurs, we think, oh, well, you know, I like, you know, romance novels, therefore everyone's got to like it. Or, you know what I mean? Like, you think, oh, I like to write my books this way, therefore my audience must like to write books this way. But then if you get a whole bunch of bad reviews and they say, hey, you know, you made this mistake, can you change it and make it this way? You need to listen to your, what your audience is saying because almost all the time your audience is not who you think they are and they're not who you are, right? So for me, I don't write my books the way that I want them like the way that I would want them for me, I write them the way that my audience wants them, which is very similar to what I want, but I also listen to what my audience says and, and how they tell me um, to change it this way and make changes that way. And what if you don't have an audience that's gonna tell you these things yet? You will, as soon as you publish your book, you'll get reviews, you'll get, you'll get an audience, yeah. <coughs> and the, the funny thing is, people, a lot of people say, you know, build your platform before you publish your book, um, which if you're traditionally published, you have to, because you can't even get the deal, generally without that. But if you're self-publishing, publish your book, then build your platform, because mm -hmm. if you don't have something to sell, mm -hmm. right. How are you going to build a platform? What, are you going to be the most helpful person on Twitter? It's like, <laughs> and you can just you can your entire lifetime to doing that, and you never get anywhere, you never make any money, you never really impact people in the way that you want to. To answer your question, the way I did that was telling the story of, of how I'm building Alizar and yeah. the things that I'm doing to make this. Yeah, that's awesome. And so that's how I'm building my platform before my book, first book comes out. And that's such a great idea. And, and it's like 70% of people um, say they want to start a business, and about the same number, 70% of people say they, say they want to write a book. <laughs> right? So like almost everyone who's following you, uh, you know, they want to write a book. So like secretly or maybe subconsciously or maybe totally consciously. So if you share your process, you know, and everything you go through as you're doing that on your blog, on your social media, 
people care about this stuff. And I've seen some really powerful things that people, people have done, like you know, um, previewing all the different book cover um, permutations that you went through, right? Um, sharing about how you hired an editor and they ripped you off and you lost all this money and what you learned from the experience and how that helped you become a better person and a better author. That stuff is valuable. Uh, and a lot of times we think, oh, well, it's just my life, you know, who cares, right? But um, sharing that process of what you're going through can be a really great way to connect with your audience. Yes, one of the things which a lot of people a lot of writers don't do, which really, okay, they don't listen to the criticism of other people, mm -hmm. and they also don't answer their readers. Mm -hmm. If you don't acknowledge your readers, they're not going to be readers anymore. They're going to leave. You may engage with your audience. I'm sorry? Engage with your audience. Yes. Yeah. And you'd be surprised at how many of these authors I have met that just think that's below them. Right. <laughs> wow. I don't yeah. know what they think they're selling. I, I, yeah. I don't okay, I don't, okay, I'm, I'm uh, passionate. My degree's in management, okay? <laughs> it blows my mind to see authors sit there and act like they don't have to market anything. Yeah. And they don't have to answer. They don't have to care about their people. Who are well, I'll tell you, I actually have trouble like answering. Like sometimes I'll get overwhelmed and I'll be like, oh, it's too much to answer right now. I, I, and it's really, I mean, it's not that I think it's below me, it's that. Um, if you're a major introvert, that's a huge well, what challenge. You, yeah, yes. but what you do is you go back to your old, your old management style, and what you do is you sit down with about four possibilities of what they could be criticizing or asking, and you write a little blip about all three of these, all four of those, yeah. and then it's whichever applies. <laughs> exactly. And you put, and you and you cut and paste, and there you are, guy. I answered you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm a big fan of creating systems. So it's actually how I got to start in the publishing company. It was all because I started creating systems. So when I first started publishing my books, and they did really well, I had all these authors emailing me the same questions over and over again. How do I self-publish an ebook? How do I write a book? You know, same questions. So I just created these little videos, tutorials to teach people how I did. And then I had these stock responses that I couldn't ever know. So it would just be an email response. Hi, thanks so much for your question. You know. Uh, you know, a lot of other people have asked the question, so I create a video, here's a video, here's what you're gonna learn, and just copy and paste that, and you know, personalize it a little bit, and send it off. And that way, instead of you know, spending an hour thinking, oh, how should I answer this question, and how much time should I spend answering this question, you know exactly right away, you can get it done in two, three minutes at the most. Just so, make sure it is on topic. I get, I get all kinds of interesting political things from, from right. senators and congressmen that have absolutely nothing to do with what I said. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> It should also be noted that when you said you created videos answering your response, right? Right. That's because the average American spends 17 minutes reading a day and 67 hours watching a video. Mm. 67 hours a day. Six to seven hours. Oh, six to seven. Yeah. 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 I know. yeah. So when you're thinking about what kind of content you should be creating, mm -hmm. keep that in mind. Yeah. That video is powerful. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your own experiences. I'm thinking you publish 12 books in a year. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like wondering about like your process for getting those out, and then with that much content out so quickly, like where along in the, your process did you do all these things, and like how did it all fit together? Because that's that's an enormous amount yeah. out in a very yeah. short time. Like you know, even like the editing process, like how did you pull all that together along yeah. with? Well, I write nonfiction. So I don't write novels. So it's not 300 page novels. They're like you know 50 to 150 page nonfiction ebooks. Sure. Um, so that's one thing. Um, but all those all those manuscripts were either half done or more. So they were, you know, all the content was basically written. It was basically just, you know, going through the final stages of writing or editing for most of them. Um, but basically, I was working full time, and I was working like eight hours a day at least every day. Um, and so, you know, in the morning, the first thing I do is I get up and I write um, for a couple hours, and then I take a break, and then I go do the marketing stuff, so writing articles for my blog or doing social media and that kind of things. Um, and then. You know, the cool thing about being a self-published author and today is like it's so easy now to hire people to do things. So you can go to Fiverr.com. All my first book covers were from Fiverr.com. It's five dollars for a book cover. If you don't like it, get ten of them. You spend fifty bucks, save yourself a ton of money, and you have ten different covers to choose from. Because um, you can always change it. The great thing about self-publishing now is you can always change it. So you know, if you don't like a cover, go get another one. Uh, when you get enough profits from your book, go upgrade. You can have the most expensive cover in the world. And dollars um, for what? Sort of a book cover. Yeah. So Fiverr.com is a service where you 
can pay somebody five dollars for anything. So you could say, um, write this email for me, I'll give you five dollars. Make me a book cover, I'll give you five dollars. And everything is a five dollar transaction and there are people who will do these things. Typically they live in the Philippines. Or <laughs> South Africa. Or South Africa. Or Brazil. Or other places where people, you know, <laughs> they have the skills, they need the money. Um, so it's just the system for this website. There are other ones, like for example, Odesk, you can hire a freelancer and pay them a variable rate. But Fiverr.com's, what's that? Elance, right. So Fiverr.com's concept is the $5 thing. Um, so it's a great way to like so block your money, right? Here's, here's an example of a system that you could put in place if you had a non-fiction book. Much, much easier than a fiction book. Um, if you've got a subject that you're an authority on, I could sit down with this gentleman here and interview him for two hours. We can record that entire thing and then send that audio tape off to somebody on Fiverr who for maybe 10 or 15 dollars will transcribe two to three hours of that and create a 50 exactly. to 100 page ebook, which I then send off to an editor, which might cost me $100 to have them edit the thing into some kind of beautiful format. I pay $5 for a cover, within maybe three or four days I've got a new book. Right. Wow. Yeah, I've been using the, the, the Google transcription on YouTube and to transcribe my blog. Right. And it Google gets like fifty percent of it right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Machines aren't quite there yet. Pretty soon, in a couple of years, they probably will be really good. Yeah. So for now, they have transcription, but it depends on your accent too. Yeah. <laughs> my friend has an Australian accent. It doesn't understand a thing he's saying. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah. Okay, so you were saying um, you got up in the morning, you wrote for an hour or two. Mm -hmm. Then you switch, you did marketing in the world? Yeah, then I switch to do marketing, eat lunch, go back to writing, on marketing. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, in the day, you're, you know, you're emailing your editors, your cover designers, whoever you have on your team that you need to get work done. So you outsource a lot of the work? Yeah, I outsource everything except for the writing and editing, pretty much, and the marketing. Yeah, so the cover design, I'm dipping in it. Cover design, you know. <laughs> 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 the writing and editing and marketing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so cover design, you know, you hire a professional. Even if for $5, they're going to do something better than you can do unless you're a professional designer. Um, editing, you're going to want a professional editor, especially for your first book. So if you don't have the budget, you know, okay, fine. Don't don't worry about it now. Um, but get someone, get someone else, you know, partial. So in a writer's group, you, you, can, you can swap, you know, edits with each other. You can say, hey, you know, I'll edit your book, you edit mine. Um, get some you know kind what? Of feedback. Go to Texas State University to the Writing Center uh -huh. and have some one of them edit your book if you if you absolutely cannot afford to. Just don't. Yeah, there are low cost there ways. Is, there's, 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 there's low cost there and very a, high. Yeah, there's a pro writing a pro writer .com. It's in England, so they're going to argue with you about a few things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's thirty five dollars a year. No, I think it's fifty dollars now. They have a sale thirty five dollars a year. You just cut and paste, and they tell you where your commas are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. If you if you've misplaced a deal or something like this, that's proofreading the center. Yeah, that's that's, awesome. that's so awesome. You know, you know, so but that's that. Okay, oh, that's the last thing. You, after you have someone yeah. read it and critique yeah. it and all that sort of thing, and be a beta reader and this sort of thing. But if you just want to get it down to to that, I guess my thing is. Don't pay a lot of money for somebody to argue over where a comma goes. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, totally, totally. Don't so, Tom, are you working a full-time job in your business? No. No? You're doing this full-time? Oh, right, you had that other business before, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So, at what point did you stop that business and move to doing Kind of when, I, when we moved to Hawaii. It was kind of that transition. Okay. Um, so, had you already, you had published your first book, and then you quit your job and focused on it? Basically, well, I never really had a job. I had my business. So right. I had a right. business. I kind of faced it out and said, hey, you know, I'm mm. dropping this business. So you're from Hawaii? I live in Hawaii now, yeah. Oh. Do you recognize that number? Somebody from Hawaii just called me. The anyway number, yeah. <laughs> I don't know who it is. I mean, is that somebody who might have been yeah, trying to call you? <laughs> I doubt it. No. Okay, because they would have been calling the studio. I don't know. Mm. All right. <laughs> it's a yeah. thing. Oh, no, no, no. You mentioned beta readers, so that's where also where social network comes in again, because like I have like three or four award-winning authors who are willing to beta read my book before I publish it, because I want to bother them on social media. So that's like a big deal. Yeah, but the other thing I would say about Bay readers, though, is, um, sorry to interrupt, but just don't wait forever. No, it's great if someone says I'm gonna, I'm gonna read your book, and then four months later they're gonna be around to it, and you're waiting to publish your book until you get that feedback. You're you're wasting your time. Yeah. But um, if they can be fast about it, I always tell people, you know, look, if you can't read in the next two weeks, um, this isn't an opportunity for you right now. Um, otherwise, you know, you're gonna be waiting forever. Sorry, let's let's. Sorry, yeah, about Kickstarter. So my plan is to. Um, 
in terms of my budget, what I'm asking for, I'm asking for the money to pay the artist to do the cover of some of the inner, uh, inner artwork, mm -hmm. and also for editing. So like, that's a re that's not that much money. So like, um, I'm using it totally for that. So I think that's a good way to get the money for editing mm -hmm. if you need it. Yeah. So. People understand that they want to know, oh yeah, it makes sense, you know, as the book to make it better. So yeah, I'll fund that. You know. I think one of the okay, one of the important things that I have found out since I'm on my my fourth editor, um, you have to have an editor that knows what you're writing about. Yes. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. You really yeah. This is so very very interview them. Interview the person that you're going to I think the, the biggest writing. misrepresentation that I've seen so far is that you have editors who will advertise what they will accept, what they will accept for submissions, mm -hmm. and what they do primarily, but they won't tell you, well, but 90% of what I do is romance. And you right. need to ask them, if 90%, you know, how, how much yeah. fantasy do you do? Yeah. How much romance mm -hmm. do you do? How much of what I am yeah. writing do you do? That's the biggest mis misrepresentation that I have seen online so far. Well, not only that. Uh, okay, to me the argument is, oh, I'm an editor, I can edit anything. No, you can't. Yeah. No, no, you no. Cannot. don't even, don't even let them know that. If that's your attitude, yeah. just run. Yes. Get right. If that's your attitude, run. Yeah. That's right. And definitely, so uh, I have a rule of three, always, whenever I'm going to hire someone to do anything, I always want to get three um, different contractors I'm going to talk to and three referrals. Right, so you know the biggest mistake you can make is say, oh, you know my my brother's neighbor is a cover designer, and he's just gonna says, oh, I'll do a cover design for you. You say, oh, great, that'd be wonderful, and they do the cover design for you, and it's awful, and he gives you a bill for a thousand dollars, and you pay it because you think that's what a fair price is for a cover design. And you got completely ripped off and got really bad. Well, problem. I think that's a, I mean, especially now, right? I mean, that cannot be hard to find three people who write who have already yeah, it's used. Not difficult and, at all. I mean, yeah. I, that seems like a really good. But you just got to do it, and always get three referrals and, and call them up and say, hey, you know, people referrals or references. Sorry, not referrals, but references of people who have, you know, other authors who hired that editor, or hired that cover designer, and and what and, you and know, make sure those people are in your field when you're doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you write mysteries, don't get a fantasy writer or don't get some fantasy writer to give you referral <laughs> referrals. <Yeah. laughs> it it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to ask about like funneling. Like funneling, funnels? yeah. Like marketing funnels, yeah. Uh huh. Um. So like, would you generally funnel like on your Facebook page or Twitter and all that? Generally, aim people towards your website where there's an outlet where they're gonna buy your books on Amazon and whatnot. Like. So it depends what you're doing. So if I'm doing a book launch, I'm always linking to Amazon. Okay. If I'm not doing a book launch, I'm just doing like adding value. I want to probably go to my website. Right, because my website's gonna add more value. Amazon's not adding value. So when someone goes to your Amazon page, they have two choices. They can buy or they can leave. Hmm. It's not adding value, right? Um, but if you're adding value, you're building up your platform, then you know you go to your website, you've got more valuable things on your website. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, in terms of if you don't mind, um, in terms of like when you're looking for, for content to put on your site and ways to be valuable and be useful, um, one of the ways that you can hunt traffic is go on to Google, go on to Amazon, go on to YouTube, and type in your, your major themes or, or content forms, you know, cozy mystery. As you start to type that, it's gonna auto-complete and give you like a list of 12 things that you might be searching for, right? Mm -hmm. That's because those are the 12 things that have most frequently been searched for. There are your 12 blog posts. Yeah. Right thing. Well, you can do the same thing on Amazon. You can write right. a romance novel on Amazon and it has space and they'll tell you everything else that people are writing. Although it's interesting through. because um, the auto auto suggestions on smart. YouTube will be different than the auto suggestions on Google Image, Google Search will be different than well, and Google search. and Google is smart, right. so you have to be careful to remember you. Yeah, that's you. Mm -hmm. so. Right, right. Amazon's very <laughs> uh, <laughs> Amazon's very good about their search. Well you do the incognito search, right? No, there you go. You yeah. to, There's yeah. also a keyword planner tool that Google allows people to use. But I'm just saying, like, if you're going on YouTube and you search for cozy mysteries, you're searching for, you're going to get the 12 most common results on the video search, not mm -hmm. on the web search. Mm -hmm. right? right. So just be sure what you're right, looking Right, but if at. you're looking to create content, if yes. I'm looking to create video content, I'm going to go right. on to YouTube. Video content, yeah. Right. For sure. If I'm going to do. But not blog, blog posts. posts. Can well, I would. Unless you would put videos a, a video in the blog post. Log sure. and fold it into the blog. I mean, that's the way I would do it because I would drive traffic from both sources. Mm -hmm. can, um, I, can I ask you to go back to what you were talking about before? And you said um, how you, when you were funneling to Amazon and when you were funneling to your website. Right, so if you're doing a book launch, right. for me, a book launch, I want to sell as many books as possible in like one day or a week or like a so small period of time. Right. So all the traffic in the during the book launch, everything I promote is going to say, hey, go buy my book on Amazon, buy my book on Amazon. 
Okay, Go so I have a question for you. This may be just completely stupid, um, but I'm like kind of watching to see what other people are doing, right? And so I'm trying to pick the people who are doing well and do what they do. So um, I have always linked directly to Amazon for everything, right? Because that's the only place I sell anything. But my hope is that next year I will be selling on iBooks and Barnes and Noble as well, right? I mean, the hope is to have you know multiple streams from to multiple retailers. So that is not true for me right now, but that is my hope. And so as I move, you know, to try and push in that direction, I've set up my website so that I have a page for each of my books with at the very top all of the retailers linked. Mm -hmm. So I'm now driving in my back matter to my website and not where I used to drive, which was directly to Amazon. So it's a two click instead of a one click. Because I really want <laughs> uh, it's gonna decrease your conversions a lot. Yeah, yeah. I so really are you, want are you to selling mostly ebooks, paperbacks, or audiobooks right now? Um ebooks. Right. So Amazon owns like seventy percent plus of the US ebook market, like eighty percent plus of the UK. Right. The only real big markets right now. Um, the other, all the other countries are years behind, right? So seventy percent plus of your sales are gonna be ebooks anyways. Or seventy percent of your ebook sales are gonna be Amazon anyways. And if right now you're only available on them, uh, you know Well I'm not. I mean I'm right. I'm so what I'm saying is, you know, yeah. they're the vast majority of the market. Every click you have in the way of them buying is going to decrease your conversion right. about half. Yeah. So it's not worth it to have that. Okay. So and, the... and even like even like the most successful novelists in the world, they sell very few books from their websites. Very few. So okay. Selling the books from the retailers. So, it's so I mean, seventy-five percent of all online sales happen on one website. One. So, so say you have a book on Kobo, Barnes and Noble, iBooks, whatever you do, right. like promotion. Right. Which one do you link to? Amazon. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, so you know the statistics, which is why I'm asking this question. In my personal experiences, I'm talking to people as they're becoming more successful. They're telling me all of my income comes from Amazon. That's no longer true. Now, a significant portion of my income comes from Barnes and Noble and iBooks. Wow. Now I'm doing as well on iBooks as I do on Amazon. That's what I'm hearing from like individuals, and again, you know, that's yeah. anecdotal. It's but based. like it seems like in Australia, Kobo book is big. Sure. Like Same yeah. in Canada. Sure. So. Yeah, and Kobo is big in Canada, and but I'm just saying, in talking to individuals, like that's why I'm like, oh, well, you know, in in theory, I would like to do well on those others as well, but if there's no way for me to kind of root people to those I mean, buy options, but you're saying that's bad. Create what's called a landing page or a lead page, which mm -hmm. would not be on your well, it could be on your main website. Um, but something called leadpages.com, and it's a pretty expensive service. It's like 37 a month or 67 a month for the high-end version. But they'll create like really fancy, like customized, amazing lead land, landing pages, lead pages for people, or squeeze pages to build your email list. And it's basically instead of hiring a designer for like thousands of dollars or web designer to do it, you basically have templates. And so the template on there for selling books, and they'll have a link to uh, Kindle or, or Amazon. It'll have iBooks. It'll have Kobo. It'll have uh, Nook, they'll have everything on there uh, with the buttons and everything. All you do is put the links in for your particular books, and you'll get much higher conversions using something like that than a website like on your blog with like the sidebar there and all the other links. Because the more stuff you have navigating on your website, okay. the less your conversions are going to be. Okay, so um, the only way I'm using it right now, maybe I'm just screwing this up, I don't know. Um, the only way I'm using it right now is I have a page that is for a specific book, and on, for that specific book, I have all the retailers at the very top. If you go to my back matter, there's a list of my books, right? And then when you click on that, it's going to take you to that page, and you can buy from any of those retailers. Right. Look, I, I think that's, that's still fine to have that's that bad, page, bad or... but when you're doing a launch, you're not driving traffic to that page. You're driving traffic directly to the retailer. Right. Okay. To Amazon. I, I think, okay. I mean, yeah. What okay. you're doing is logical from the back matter. Okay. What he's talking about is, is the book the launch. Book launch. You want to send them directly there, because... which I am doing because I only launch on Amazon. I launch right. on Amazon, and then I have a secondary launch because I right. launch on KU. Whatever. I mean, that's my yeah, thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Totally. But yeah, so so for my launch, I am launching right. on KU, and then for my secondary launch, I am launching. Yeah. So on then your secondary platforms. launch is people have already bought on a Kindle, and you already tapped that market, and now you want people to go buy on other retailers, then you can do then that. you would, okay. Yeah, totally. Okay. What I was can, the name of the website that you were talking about? Um, the, the lead pages? Yeah. yeah leadpages.net. Yeah, leadpages.net. What's the first word? Lead? Lead. It's like L E A D pages.net. Yeah. So, okay. <clears throat> Something I've been wondering for a while with uh, like the idea of ebooks and everything. Like, how. I guess it doesn't matter if you're like somebody who like has not been just that way or whatever, but how vulnerable is that to just like, you know, piracy? Uh, everything on the internet is vulnerable to piracy. My books have been pirated 
tens of thousands of times. Do you actually bother to send takedown notices, or do you really? I, I was for a while, but that kind of thing wasted time now. Oh, I got a lot to say about that. Okay, yeah. so is it, not only is it a waste of time, but it makes you look like a, like a douche. I so, kind of think that too, yeah. but so, I have talked to people who say, "Does I don't care if people steal my crap, but I'm going to send a takedown to preserve my copyright. So and I'm like, like, think about what happened with Metallica and Napster. Like, people hated Metallica for what they did against Napster back, this, I mean, years and years ago. So, like, there's a guy, um, well, quite a few people, like Cory Doctorow is one of them. Mm -hmm. He's a pretty well-known author. Yeah. Um, he released his book, Little Brother, um, under Creative Commons. So it's like, you can just download for free. Um, you can do, encourage you to torrent it or whatever. That's just that book, right? Through that process, people would know who he is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. So after that, once, for if every like ten people that part of the book, there's probably like hundred that will buy it because it's getting yeah. the word out. People are, more people are reading your book in any format, whether they just bought it or not. They're telling people about it. So, so, so he was more of a statistic: hundred people rip it and ten people buy it, but it's yeah. still valid. I wouldn't, I, yeah. I wouldn't say that. There are there are authors that um, like Paulo Coelho. Uh, Specifically, pirated his own book <laughs> so that he could get his name out there. It's a yeah. it's a marketing tactic right. now. Um, but also, I think um, if you're releasing a book on Amazon, you can go into more detail about DRM. But I think you should probably not do the DRM because right. people are going to do this anyways. Right. Yeah, um, I don't think DRM is going to do is stop like a grandma or someone from sharing. Right. Or right. Well, yeah, yeah and you know the statistics. Else. Statistically, it's a bad idea, right? Uh, totally, it yeah, reduces totally. your sales. I mean, well, it's just it like reduces like your sales. I think because of the, it right? reduces piracy in a way, which. Maybe What's interesting about Little yeah. Brother uh, that he released it under Creative Commons is that Creative Commons license doesn't say that it doesn't only say that somebody can distribute this book and do what they want with it. It also says that you can create derivative works and variations yeah. on it. So right. that was an interesting move for him yes. because a lot of authors will will release their books without a DRM lock, um, but they still want to retain their copyright. Right. What Cory Doctorow right. was saying is here, do what you want with it. Create your own books out of it. Sell them. And he I, I think the few people. The condition was that. Wow. Um, was that you had to release it, whatever you make, under the same uh, right. right. Well, so, that's so all creative was, common stuff, right. isn't it? Software. So people is the take, you can take their, my stuff and do what you want with it, but then you have to let other people do what they want with your stuff. And, right. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. And so I don't know, kind of, I mean, for people like, and I don't want to like put fingers, because maybe you guys are all massively successful. Well, we know you are, but like the rest <laughs> of us are, you know, maybe somebody in here is massively successful, but I'm assuming for the most part it's like, yay for us. People want to pirate us, it gets us out there, whatever. And I have friends who are in the same situation, but their comment was, I don't care if that stuff's out there, but I want to send a takedown notice because I want to preserve my copyright because I don't want other people to sell it. So and, there's a difference between and and piracy yeah. and someone's ripping off your book. So if someone takes that, your book that's and they question. sell it under their name as if they wrote it, that's different. Yeah. If it's just piracy, so if someone takes your book and gives it for free on BitTorrent or whatever. So what are you preserving when you send a takedown notice? I mean, because I don't care. I mean, go steal my shit. Well, it depends what, I mean, the, what they're... Well, it depends what, what the infraction was, right? If somebody took your book and is selling it under their own name, yeah, send a takedown yeah, notice. They yeah. infringed upon your copyright. They're saying that they did what you did. But if somebody is just okay. uploading it for other people to read, um, you know, it's free. And it's free. Yeah. The classic thing is that, um, what do they say? Uh, obscurity is, is worse. It's the biggest. Yeah, I mean, I know I totally agree with that. Right? So I don't care if people steal my stuff. you rather be known as somebody who yeah. gets pirated often than somebody who doesn't pirated. exist? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I had a little, I had a little party for myself books. because some author sent me something saying your stuff's being pirated. And I was like, party for me. Party for me. <laughs> yeah. Think about print yeah. books. Like, you know, like in the olden days, right? We'd all have our books. We'd give them to our friends. They might get passed around. Like, I have a book that like seven different people in a circle read. Yeah. And then it might yeah. go then to half price books and somebody else buys it, but the author's not getting that money. Yeah. The half price books is getting that sure. money. But that means that many more people have seen that book. And so like the one right. that I have that was like the seventh person that read it, I didn't pay for it. But then I want to go see what else that guy's written, mm -hmm. right? And so that's where like having a back catalog seems to be most and it's like giving away the book for free on some of these services too. If somebody reads that first one and goes, Oh wow, like Cory Duck was a good right. example. Right. I first got introduced to him because of his free stuff. And so then it's like, wow, yeah. he's cool. So is it maybe a good idea so, if, you're an, if, if you are an emerging uh, author, is it maybe a good idea to just like put shit out there for free? Yes. Yeah. I was gonna say, especially so if you yeah. have shit, Okay, so I think that we can have a whole hour and a half long discussion about DRM and copyright. I'm gonna make a note of this. We might have a, a future <laughs> event good. around DRM and copyright for <laughs> books you. specifically. But, but, one more comment about that. There's these places, right? You guys probably heard of them. Where they're called libraries. <laughs> and you can read books for free. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh my god, that's really right. Surprising. Like BitTorrent is just a public online. We need to do something about those libraries. Can you write yeah. that down? Thank you very much. Make sure to expand that conversation. Yeah, point. Oh yeah, copyright yeah. and intellectual property. So DRM, very different discussion. So DRM, copyright, 
and intellectual property. Do you use Wattpad? I don't use Wattpad, no. Future event top. Got it. I'm thinking about releasing our Wattpad chapter by chapter first to build up some buzz and then put a hard in it. Yeah, you can always do that. Yeah, Kindle has something like that now, too. Mm -hmm. It's called Wallpad. Watt, W-A-T-T. Yeah, well, Kindle, Kindle was yeah. right on. It's a different community. I know, but They're I like them. With it. I um, still like them. Interesting. Because they, they, they offer contracts to people yeah. through there. Is there anything else you want to say? We're coming up on an hour and 15 minutes. I think if anybody wants to ask any more questions, now is probably the time. Yeah, any last questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what's up? <laughs> Why not? Um, so I was thinking, like, because I'm a big audiobook fan, and, and I got introduced to indie authors way back in the dark ages when they were just doing audio publishing. Yeah. Um, and anyway, so I was thinking I'd like to release the first book of my series as a free audiobook. Mm -hmm. ACX doesn't really, unless... No, ACX sets the price for you, can't, you can't uh, change the price. Yeah, so, so you couldn't do free audio for ACX. So, I mean, I was wondering, like, could I pay an ACX audiobook narrator up front and then release it on some other sites? Um, you might be able to find them through ACX, but you wouldn't be able to pay them through ACX. So you'd have to find them, get their personal contact info off of ACX, negotiate the deal separately, you pay them with PayPal or check or whatever, and then you could do that. Oh, you might want to go right, to the ACX has a contract in there with the, with the narrators, so ACX does the contract for you. And when you yeah. sign that contract, you wouldn't be able to change the contract. They're the middleman, no matter yeah. how you I bet you could it. find somebody. To but it's like, like, yeah. like yeah. guru.com. Oh, patiobooks.com. Or we live in Austin. Yeah. I mean. You Right. Like everybody has. Well, here's the thing though, I'm yeah. going to sell the other five audiobooks. Right. And I'd want the same narrator. Mm -hmm. But if you could find somebody for just, I'm just being devil's advocate, but if you could find somebody local who did it for a reasonable price, you could continue to hire them and you could work out any deal you wanted with them for whatever yeah. rights or splitting. I mean, or that's whatever. what I'm, that's what These I'm are doing. Are 100,000 more books. I think we talked about this last time. Right. Yeah. And my suggestion yeah, was yeah. For, find a narrator locally. Yeah. And then, once you are ready to sell them all, have an ACX narrator redo the first book. Because that way they're separate products because they're separate narrators and they won't impinge upon each other. ACX can't say, well, you can't release that other one for free because it's a different narrator, it's a different product. Well, it's, it, an audiobook is a performance. Yes. And so, the thing about a, about a narrator is that um, really it's acting, right? Yeah. What you're trying to find is an act. Actor. You're trying to find a, vo a voice actor. Um, and so, a, a lot of people that there's a kind of there's kind of a tendency of like in, introverted people that think that they want to be audio narrators. <laughs> really, they tend, they, they tend there's a lot of audio. I've heard a lot, listened to a lot of audio books. Some of them are pretty, uh, pretty bad, and uh, very few of them are very very good in terms of performance. You know, go, oh, and typically they're actors are the ones that are the most extraordinary. Uh, oh yeah, I wouldn't narrate my own. Yeah. And so, you'd be good. Going, you know, contact going into the acting community might be a better uh, way to get a, a good somebody that doesn't have yeah. audio book experience, yeah. but they have acting experience. Yeah, I've got a radio personality who's supposed to be doing mine just because well, I, I know him. Theater department yeah. students, right? Yeah. I think the only thing with the, with the audio books though is people want to make sure they actually know how to edit them and master them. Right. Right. Because that is the most expensive part by far. Anyone can do voice acting. Right. Um, but in terms of like the actual cost of production, it, you know, most and that it actually in yeah. Austin should be not a problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's not a problem. you probably know someone or know someone who knows someone who does that professionally and gets paid <coughs> a lot of money. Great landscape for them. Right, or you can go to Channel Austin and they can either connect you with folks or um, take the classes so you can do it yourself. <coughs> Any questions? Yeah. So, um, pricing structure. I, I forget where I was, some kind of seminar of some sort, and they were talking about um, the best idea in terms of pricing your ebooks, right? So, the guy was talking about um, you could try to sell it for like $14.99 or whatever, and let's say you sold, I don't know, 200 copies at that rate, or you could sell it for 99 cents, and you probably sell 10,000 copies, and it's a lot more money. So, what do you think about what's like the sweet spot do you feel like in terms of? So, pricing? for novels, uh, for self published authors, 99 cents to 3 dollars is like the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. um, that's for fiction? For fiction, yeah. That's definitely the sweet spot for an ebook right now. Um, if you go above that price, it's going to be, if you don't have a platform yet, uh, it's going to be really hard to get you know, that kind of time sales traction. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you've got a trilogy or a series, you might want the first book at 99 cents and the other books at 2.99 or 3.99. Uh, it's probably your best bet. Do you think that uh, first book free model is kind of dead? No, it's not dead at all. It totally works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can totally do the first book for free as well. 
Yeah, uh, I like with Amazon. I like um, not permanent. So there's a couple things you can do, like a KDP select free promotion for five days, right. which is okay. Um, but you can do permanently free on Amazon. So what you do is you publish your book on Amazon, and then you would also publish it not in, not in KDP select, just not exclusive mm -hmm. to Amazon. Then you publish it, you know, everywhere else, like iBooks and everything, and then you you market free on those other platforms. You tell Amazon, hey, my book is free on iTunes or whatever. Can you please price match that down to zero? Right. And they'll price match that down to zero, mm -hmm. and then you can have it free for a couple months or whatever. Get a bunch of reviews, get a bunch of sales, and then later on, you can always change the price and say, hey, now the price can match it back to. And, and just to be clear, this only work this like marketing funnel tactic because it is a marketing funnel tactic only works if you have a series, right? Book, yes. It only work if you have a series. Okay. But so it works you have best if you have a series. Yeah, you so only have one. I mean, if you're, you're, you're a novelist, <laughs> if you're a novelist, everything works best in a series. Yeah, yeah, so a series yeah, is always going to be your best bet. Let's say you, you have a horror cool. novel and a romance novel, and you have the horror one free. Yeah, that's not, not going to cross. No, no, no. Yeah, right. but what is the what do you find is the tipping point? You know, should you have free plus two, free plus three, free plus? When does it become the same kind of novels though? Yeah. Yes. Some crossover. Right. Yes, but right. the, the read through rate is higher on an actual series, but yeah. it's the same character. No doubt. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. For free books, I don't think you should ever have more than one free book. No, no, I mean, free plus, like, at what point in a series would it be financially advantageous for you to set the first one free? When you have one buy through, or when you have two buy through, or when you have three, like, when you I have. I want at least a trilogy. You want at least a trilogy, so one free, to, or one free, two to buy. Right. So it's the minimum, and then. And then remember, the free is only temporary. Mm -hmm. It could be long term. Like if you have like a book that you always want to be free, that's fine. What's wrong with that? What would, be, what would be better to do? Have have one free book or one for okay. Have your first have your first in the series, either for either free or free or ninety nine cents, and then have the others marked up. Or should it be this is a launch? It's it's ninety nine cents right now, and then in three days it'll be two ninety nine. Mm -hmm. Like uh, that with every one of them, or or what is the? Well, I mean, if you do the first book for free, the, the other book should be full price, so two ninety nine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, okay, okay, um, okay. Is the is the is the three for five days better for each one of the books, or should you simply keep one book, like the first book, free, and the others at two ninety nine? Uh, I'd rather just have the one book free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Because then you're getting people into your funnel. Also, that that five day five. A free promotion for Amazon is a KDP Select feature, and you only get it once every ninety days. It's not a long-term tactic. Okay. Tactic, but I think the, the lesson to take away here is it depends what your what your strategy is, what your goal is, right? Okay. Um, one last question: If you're if you're a new author, like say you're like I'm gonna write a trilogy, and you publish just one book, that should be full price, right, or ninety nine cents or something. You can't set it free until you get the third book out. I mean, I wouldn't set it free. Yeah, it's not financially advantageous, right? Right. right? right, yeah. You definitely, you always want money to coming in. So if you're at a point where money's not coming right. in, so right. like books are free, then you kind of messed up. Yeah, just put it in your words. Any other questions? What are your books? Um, you can see them amazoncom slash author slash business. You can see all my books there. But what are they about? So I write. Um, I've got several books for authors. I've got the Kindle Publishing Bible series. So uh, there's a book on nonfiction writing. Uh, you know, formatting your ebooks, publishing your ebooks, marketing your ebooks, going on their platform. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> so you're expecting some sales. This is your author you're platform today. Because we came here, right? <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about GPK Publishing. Um, so it's, it's a publishing company. Um, it's basically I, the, way, the reason I created. So first, I had my own books, and then people started asking questions about you know, how do you publish. So I wrote books for authors and how to do that. And then I created a video course for authors on how to do that. And basically, half the people watched my video course and said, hey, I love your video course. I love everything you're teaching me about self-publishing, but I just want someone else to do that marketing stuff for me. So can you do that for me? Mm -hmm. so that's basically how I came about. So are you still taking new authors? Yeah, we are. Uh, nonfiction only? Uh, no, we do nonfiction and fiction. Um, so our requirements are they have to have a minimum of three books, three full-length books. So it have to be like three full-length novels. Uh, it has to be a major market. So like sci-fi, fantasy, romance, thriller, mystery. Those are the major markets. We don't do children's books. Um, yeah, if you're interested, it's tckpublishing.com, and there's a big contact form on there. You can email me at more info. Do you have a card? tckpublishing.com. So it's a matter yeah. of three books, or it's a matter of three books that all have to be in a series? Three books. They don't have to be all in a series. You're basically the just writing them that they're actual authors. Right. Yeah. Okay. Because one book deals just don't work. Right. Do you read the books? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Uh, and 
Not uh, like I don't read them when you submit to me. I read them later on in the process. But yeah. Last question. Tell us about the podcast you're doing. So I've got a podcast called the Publishing Profits Podcast Show. Uh, just publishingprofitspodcast.com. And basically, we interview best selling authors, a lot of self published authors on there, a few traditional published authors on there, um, agents, uh, online marketers, all kinds of people. And we talk about, you know, how to write books, how to publish them, how to market them, make money. Profits um, or profits? I like profits. P R O F I T S. Okay. Yeah. As in money. I the first thing. Yeah. 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 Shaking profits. When you said we talked to people, and so I thought maybe it was kind of a play on. Yeah. 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 I totally thought that as well. Oh. Um, so once you publish your ebook, um, and let's say you generate a lot of sales from that, uh, how would you use that to approach? Let's say I wanted to go to a traditional publisher to do the physical copy because I don't have the resources to publish, you know, uh, print books. I mean, could I use my? Could I use that sort of as a, a means to approach them and say, hey, I want my? If your sales book. are really impressive, so you have to have over five thousand sales minimum. Yeah, right. I would even consider it. Right. Because otherwise, you shouldn't tell them you have a really book published. I it was but you do have the resources. There's print on demand stuff. Create Space will do the interior design, design for you, or you can contract somebody to do the interior design. Um, and you can sell a print book on okay. Amazon. There's yeah. no, no reason you can't do that right now. I just, but I guess my only reason for wanting to do go through a publisher is because of the legitimacy, right? You know, if you have to like tour sure. orbit the back of your book, it's like, oh, that's a real sure. book. I mean, I, I'm well, not saying that um, you shouldn't want to traditionally publish. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great goal, and there's a lot of added value that a traditional publisher can can give you but I wouldn't at the same time I wouldn't say that I can't publish a print yeah, book right. because you could do you could do an ebook an audiobook a print book for your novel and still eventually later be traditionally published what would happen is you would approach them or they would approach you they would say yes we'll publish your book you'd take it down and then they'd republish it right. like having a print book for a print on demand thing is not going to make you uh, unavailable. So and I mean, you know comparatively, what, I mean? what would you guys say for traditionally publishing? Is it harder to get a traditionally published contract for print and e or for print only? I would think it would be harder for print only. Print only is harder. Yeah. Right. Most of the problems now on, on the ebooks. I mean, the people right. I'm seeing that have print There's only no deals are like huge. Like huge. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Only deals. Like. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. So there's a great example of what you're talking about. A guy named Jason Gurley wrote um, a novel. I think it's called Eleanor, uh, and it had a print copy. Um, he's a designer, so he did the cover himself. It's beautiful. He has an ebook. He just got a traditional publishing deal. He said, anybody that wants the, the first edition of Eleanor better buy it now because the book is going to get taken down in two days so that the so publisher that can republish it with their own cover. Yeah. Now, the question on that, if you, if you go that route, though, don't you then fall into the same trap that any like first-time traditional publishing, like, the odds of you making money on that traditional publishing are going to be much lower than if you've been if you've made enough sales to as an indie publisher, publish yeah. to it's right. Wouldn't you yeah, be then ultimately right. trading out? For okay, if yeah, I can just make a suggestion, yeah. if if all you're worried about is legitimacy, create a layer between you and your audience. Create a publishing imprint. Right. And continue to refer to it in a third person, like you're the queen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, like seriously. If that's all you're worried awesome about, a publisher it just released. Right. Yeah. No, like, yeah. Well, and I've heard this a lot though. If, if a reader goes to the bookstore, are they going to look at the penguin on the spine? No. No one can. No one knows. On Amazon, that. they can't. Then most people don't know where to look. They right. don't yeah. care to look. So right. unless you get a most really sweet deal, it seems like it wouldn't be worth it. Yeah. yeah. Most like I, publishers yeah. spend ninety-five percent of their advertising budget on the top two percent of their the authors. Right. Oh yeah. J.K. Rowling, John Grisham, Stephen King—they're getting all the money. You're doing all your own marketing anyway. Right. If yeah. you've sold enough books at this point to attract a major publisher, you don't need them anymore. And your yeah, right. and your ebook royalties comparatively are really crap. Right. And this really is something cool. that Frank said last time um, that publishers had never done author marketing. I mean, I, I I don't want people to to come away from this thinking, oh well, I'm going to publish an ebook now, and then a traditional publisher is going to pick me up, and then it's going to be easy street because it's not. They don't <laughs> do marketing for yeah. authors most of the time. Uh, if you're uh, Dean Koontz, yeah, they're going to do some marketing <laughs> for you. But unless you're the top 2%, chances are you're going to do all your own marketing anyway. So I think it, especially if you're going to go like indie first, just focus on it as if that's the end goal. And if a publisher happens to approach you, like has happened to many self-published authors, like awesome. And then you have leverage as well. You know, you're not like, please publish my book. You know, you're saying, I've already got sales. I have an audience. I know how to do this. 
Sure, I'll give you maybe the print book. I'm going to keep the ebook though, and that. Or I'll give you my next series, but I'm keeping this one. Right. And that's why I say legitimacy in quotes. I mean, I'm not, I'm not totally. saying that people that have self published are not legitimate. Because no, I, I don't and, believe it. I mean, I would totally love to be published by a traditional publisher, right. but at the same time, I'm not going to wait around for them to do it. Yeah. And so now I'm wondering about how, in terms of legitimacy of uh, traditional publishing, how this plays into like awards and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're a self published author, are you going to get how are you going to get noticed by like Hugo mm -hmm. or Nebula or whoever? Let's I say don't think they even. Going, uh, I mean, every yeah. award. Like so company or organization have their own rules about so a lot of them just they want to have self published books, right? Yeah, that's um, but I mean, like, who cares? Are you writing for awards? Are you writing because you want people to read your books? I mean, yeah. it's really up to you and what your goal is. Right. Um, but you can research the different awards and see which ones you want. And if you're good enough to get a Hugo, my guess is a traditional publisher is probably going to find you for that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, like, like I mean, like I interviewed Hugh Howie on the show, and you know, he sold like two million books self published, and he got a big print only deal. And you know, and we were talking about his deals, and he turned down like a like a multi million dollar deal because they wanted the ebook rights. And he was like, "There's no way I'm giving you the ebook rights." Right. Because when you look at the numbers, he was making so much more money self publishing. There was no way, because you know, it's a business. So when you have a publisher, they're taking some of the profits, and when it's a traditional publisher, they're taking eighty to ninety percent right. of the royalties. So, you know, you have to sell ten x as many books just to break even. Right. Right. You have you've had authors you know, who have actually bought their stuff back from publishers mm -hmm. so they could make more money. Exactly. I mean, yeah. you know, it's oh. money up front. <laughs> okay, uh, one more question. One more question we can take, um, and then we're going to talk about what our next meetup is going to be. Anybody have one last question? Actually, um, when we were talking about, I guess people talking about, like, would it be worth it to go to a traditional publisher after, I've heard some people talk, I guess, maybe, Think like because I have a lot. Of, I actually know a lot of people who like been reading it all their lives, or may or actually even the ones who don't read as much, but they'll read a print book they, before they would pick up an ebook. Like I know, or possibly audiobook too. But like I know a lot of people who just say, yeah, I don't want to read a book on a screen. So I mean, would it be worth it to reach those readers? I guess if like if your book if your book is getting so big that you have a traditional uh, publisher coming to get it, I mean, would it be worth it to I guess go to them to expand that market? I would go for the print only deal. I would negotiate really hard for that. Yeah, that's what I would do. But I mean, you yeah. know. Everyone's got to make their own and your books are your books are available in print. I mean, yeah, tiny little yeah. crappy sales that I have, I sell print books, mm -hmm. and I'm constantly shocked. I'm like, how did you even find me, and why are you buying this? <laughs> <laughs> but yes. yet they sell. It's not know? to say that traditional publishers aren't valuable in other senses. Like, uh, for example, um, if you are self-published in the U.S. and the U.K. and you want to get a German version out, right, to the mm -hmm. German market, chances are you're going to want a traditional publisher to handle that. Because okay. unless you want to take on the whole task of yeah. getting a translator, yeah, you know, that's, you're, that's you're, actually yeah. not true anymore. There are a few. There's like one really big one. There's a few companies that do the translation and marketing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but you yeah, have to get in with them. It's, it's, right? Yeah, yes. they specialize yeah, in that, and they sure. but but it's they work with indies, mm -hmm. and they have like a big waiting list, and they have it's, it's mm -hmm. a big deal. But, but there are you options, pay for, right? right? Yeah, I'm not saying there aren't options. You would pay. Yes, you would. When we're talking about rights and the rights that you can sell, the rights you can keep, the rights you can give away. And control into deals. I think the takeaway from this whole thing is that you've got to be treating writing as a business yeah, totally. and you've got to educate yourselves on all aspects of the business, including marketing and the legal aspect. If you can't read and understand your own contracts, mm -hmm. fix that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Tom. Awesome, thank you, everyone. Thank you.